Hello, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Steve Marks, Chair of the CMC Board of Directors and the President of Handa News Service here in Columbus. It's great to see you all on our live stream today. Um, I'd like to share a word about membership. Conversation moves us forward, and members power our conversations. We need you, the patrons and fans of CMC, to step up and support CMC. Please join us in our mission by becoming a member today. We are live streamed today thanks to our live stream partners, the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. We'd also like to thank those of you watching today who purchased a virtual seat. We are very grateful for this support and are able to continue live streaming services in large part because of you. Thank you. The Columbus Metropolitan Club Political Series Forums are brought to us today with support from Hanna News Service and the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. Please welcome Jack Irvin, Pre Vice President of Public Policy at the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation to introduce our forum. Jack. Thank you, Steve. Ohio Farm Bureau is proud to support the Columbus Metropolitan Club and these public conversations on important topics, especially during this political season. Ohio's 12th Congressional District is located here in the central portion of the state and includes Delaware, Licking, and Morrow counties with the additions of portions of Franklin, Marion, Muskingum, and Richland counties. So we wanna provide the candidates as much time today as possible, so let's get right to the main event. So please welcome our three panelists here today. We have the incumbent congressman for the Ohio's 12th Congressional District, Republican Troy Balderson. We have a candidate for Ohio's 12th Congressional District seat, Democrat Elena Scheer, and candidate for Ohio's 12th Congressional seat, the Libertarian John Stewart. And our host today doesn't need an introduction, so we'll get right to it. Our news content director at WOSU Public Media, Mike Thompson. Mike, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jack, and thank you all for watching, and thank you to the candidates for uh, participating. We'll hear from the candidates in just a moment, but here are the basic rules. Of course, we want a, a cordial discussion of the important issues. The candidates and I will, will do our best to make sure each candidate has an equal opportunity, equal time to address the issues that are important during this election. I've broken the session down into different topics, and the, to start each section, we'll ask, I'll ask a question of the candidates, and they'll have two minutes to answer that question, and then after that, we'll have some follow-up ups, have rebuttals if necessary, and then we'll move on to the next topic and longer answers as well. We do have the ability to turn off the microphones, but we doubt very much that we'll have to do that given the candidates here. And of course, CMC's tradition is we will take audience from the questions, questions submitted ahead of time towards the end of the forum. Uh, Congressman Baldwin, we'll start with you. Big story of this campaign of the year, frankly, has been the coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, You've seen the news, I'm sure, over the past 24 hours. We have hit record levels of, of cases, both around the country and here in Ohio. And what would you do going forward to, as, as a member of the federal government, to address the rising level of cases that we now face? Mike, for, first of all, thank you for the question, and, and thank Farm Bureau and Hannah News for the, and the Columbus Metropolitan Club for having us here today. Um, from a federal level, so I have been from the standpoint and will continue from the standpoint of it, it is individual responsibility uh, it is what I practice, it's, it's what I push for. Um, I want the state to control. Governor DeWine has done a fantastic job. He has had to make some really, really tough decisions. Uh, I want him to make sure that he manages the state of Ohio. The federal government's role in, in this COVID, which is a global pandemic here, this, this is happening all over the world, uh, is we have provided three CARES packages passed in a bipartisan manner uh, that have helped hospitals, that have helped constituents, have helped folks in the district, individuals. Uh, we did a paycheck protection program, which kept 51 million people employed why they're getting paid. So I wanna continue doing that, but I can't emphasize enough the importance of individual responsibility. It's, it's wearing a mask, it's washing our hands, and it's socially distancing. Ms. Shear, uh, shutdowns and have economic and frankly health consequences aside from the coronavirus. Should there be a national shutdown? Should there be a national mask mandate? 
So first of all, thank you for hosting and thank you to everybody who's watching along today and participating in democracy. You have a big decision to make. The future of this district depends on this election today. Um, I am a mom, I'm a business owner, I built a national network for women and digital and tech. And what I pride myself in is the ability to bring people together. Right now, during this pandemic, I can see both sides. I own a business that took a 40 to 60% hit on its profits when the first shutdown happened because all of our in-person events were canceled. I also live with two high-risk people, my stepdaughter and my husband. So I can see both sides. And a shutdown is something none of us want. We cannot afford another shutdown uh, without, if that were to happen, and it can only happen if we're at that point where we've got overwhelmed healthcare systems, and, and in that case, we would need another stimulus package. My opponent is holding maskless rallies with hundreds of people across this district completely in, in pure disregard for health and safety. And you know, I lost my father to cancer. He died from a disease that we couldn't control. And this is one that we can control. And the fact that there are families today grieving from losing people uh, to this, it's, it's astonishing. And we have to do something about it. But we must avoid another shutdown, and we can if we wear masks, if we stay distant. My son is seven years old. He wears his mask. It was hard at first, but he does. And this grown man can't. And many other grown men can't. And, and I, I think we've got to do what we can as citizens and then not have another shutdown. We have to avoid it, but we have to work hard. Real quick follow-up. Should there be a national mask mandate? You know, Governor Mike DeWine's mandate in Ohio was very effective. I think we can put the mandate in place, but can we enforce it? It's not possible to enforce it. Okay. Mr. Stewart, in reviewing your website and your Twitter feed and your Facebook page, I could not find any reference to COVID or coronavirus. Certainly, there were no references to COVID or coronavirus on your social media feeds in the last couple of months. Is the pandemic not a major issue in your campaign and not a major issue to the folks in your district? Uh, it, it's, it is definitely an issue, and it's, a, it's an issue because of individual liberty, which is something that uh, we're very strong about. And uh, I think that the American people, I trust the American people, I think the American people have taken it very seriously, particularly in the first uh, month or so where, when we didn't realize the seriousness of the uh, situation and uh, we didn't understand the disease. And so, yes, I think we take it very seriously. I think we take the, the, uh, the concern about loss of individual liberty very seriously. So, and I would like, uh, I, I don't think mandates are the way to go. I think that uh, uh, it should be voluntary. And if it is voluntary, then we're going to need much better information than we're getting. I, I don't think the case count is a, is a good approach to know how the virus is spreading. Uh, I, I think that we clearly flattened the curve, and that was what we're, we were originally told was supposed to happen. And so we continue these emergency measures in spite of the fact that we should be celebrating success with that. I, I think wearing a mask is uh, probably the, the least important of the, uh, of the measures that are needed because there's plenty of studies out there that, that uh, show that mask wearing is not uh, not the most effective part of it, but certainly uh, we should respect people who are concerned. Uh, we should be ex polite to those people who, who uh, are concerned with it. We should definitely uh, follow all, any rules in a private uh, business. And, uh, and I don't think we should be getting confused with the social distancing and the mask wearing. I mean, it, it is, all the rules are it's either or, and somehow we seem to think that mask wearing um, is uh, social distancing plus. And, and so I, th I think in many cases this becomes symbolic. Okay. Um, uh, Congressman Bolson, I'll give you a chance to respond to the whole mask situation. Where do you stand on masks and have you held rallies where you have not mandated the folks in those 
in the audience to wear masks? Um, I, I myself have never organized a rally of, of hundreds of people. Um, I, I need to emphasize this because it, it's important. My father has cancer. My father had a massive stroke. My mother is on oxygen 24-7. My parents are very ill. I have to help take care of them. The number one thing is I'm protecting my parents, but I'm also protecting the constituents. Look, this whole COVID thing has become terribly political, and I think it's really unfortunate that we're making politics out of a global pandemic. We need to focus on what we can do and to continue focusing on getting things done, being responsible. I mean, the mask, as Dr. Scott Gottlieb told us personally, I mean, the masks are not for us. They're for the people around us. That's who we are protecting, and that's what we focus on, and that's what I want to continue to focus on. You have TV commercials, though. Supporters in restaurants not wearing masks. Are you sending mixed messages? I am not sending mixed messages. We were all socially distanced. Uh, we took great pride in making sure that that was the case when we did that. Well, Jerry, why not mandate the mask nationally? Why not? Would that help? Because despite what Mr. Stewart said, studies have shown that masks really do reduce they the do. spread. They do. Why not make it national policy so no matter where you go, it's clear you should yes, be mandated. Yes, it should. There should be a mandate. We cannot enforce it, though, and that's the problem. And that's why it comes down to every one of us individually. Uh, I'm, I'm very surprised, Troy, because you were at. We have so many photos of you close to people without pictures in public places, and I just hope that you're not visiting your parents after those events. Um, it, it, this is this is really upsetting that that we don't trust scientists and physicians right now. And the thought that we might not be right now in a moment when people are losing their lives and when businesses are closing permanently and we're all struggling so much. You know, I'm a mom. I have been home with my kids for eight months now. Eight months. If moms were handling this, it would have been taken care of months and months ago. Uh, this is something we all want the same thing. We want to get back to our lives. Um, but here's the thing. If people don't feel safe walking into a business and they see commercials uh, of, of you in a restaurant defying the, the mandates of you know, social distancing and, and mask wearing, it, until consumers are comfortable going back into these businesses, we're not going to recover. And we're not going to save lives. We know that if 97% of Americans wear their masks between now and January, we will save 100,000 lives. That's an estimate uh, from scientists and physicians who we must listen to. I am a doctor's daughter. I always will be one. Mr. Stewart, let me, let me get back to the whole individual responsibility. I understand that, but in a public health crisis, if one person, five people are not responsible as individuals, they could spread the virus to 10, 20 people. Shouldn't there be more of a government role in trying to slow the spread of the virus? Well, you, you use the word responsible, and so, but then you're indicating in your uh, suggestion that people aren't responsible. And I, I think the, the citizens should not be treated like subjects, they should be treated like citizens, and I think they are responsible, especially if they feel they're getting the truth and the whole truth. So. Um, I, you know, I, I think the people that say that we should follow science, I, many times they don't understand science. I, where where I, are you getting your truth? Well, uh, I, I get it from a number of different factors. I, can, I could give you um, a group of people, um, which I wrote down the name so I wouldn't forget, but I mean, the Wellness Forum, Pam Popper in, in, in Columbus and Worthington, Tom Rents, the attorney who is suing the state of Ohio to get more information. And they have more qualifications than Dr. Fauci, who is the head of infectious diseases and allergies. And the they, they all cite their sources, and, their, and so you can go on to their sources, which are all the scientific papers that are done. Ron DeSantis had a, had a, uh, uh, has done a wonderful job down in Florida, and he had a group of scientists. These people are usually, that, that dissent from the narrative, are scientists, and they're considered somehow, they don't count. All right, let's get, I want to move, we don't want to argue over the science, I want to move to what Congress can do. Ms. Shear, um, we are still, obviously, the cases are rising. Many parts of the economy are still suffering greatly. What level of assistance should Congress do as far as an aid package, another stimulus package? What form should it take? Who should this aid be directed to? Should Congress take this up again in the coming months? Yes, and if I were in office, unlike my opponent, I would have voted for the HEROES Act. Right now, American families 
are struggling, and we all know this, we, we are all affected by COVID on one level or another. And right now, what we have in Washington is everything that is wrong with this country. We have politicians on both sides who can't agree to disagree, but agree on the basics. We need to bail out Americans. We have been footing the bill, American taxpayers, for their inept uh, legislation for decades. And it's time that, you know, they bail us out. So at this point, before COVID hit, um, you know, nearly 50% of Americans couldn't afford a $400 emergency. And we are all hanging on. And families are struggling. And if we're not struggling, we're losing opportunity or savings. So we've got to bail out the American people first. And that has to happen as quickly as possible. The other thing that is so concerning across this district, when I talk to mayors of small cities and um, in cities like Reynoldsburg, with these job layoffs, they're losing income tax revenue, which means they're going to have to make really tough decisions with their budgets. So the HEROES Act would have also provided critical relief to cities and, and state governments. Congressman Balderson, what aid would you support going forward to help cities and towns, small businesses, individuals struggling with the pandemic? Mike, um, we are currently doing that, but I, I do want to add on the HEROES Act. Um, the last time I left Congress a couple weeks ago, they went for a vote on the floor again of the HEROES Act. It passed by seven votes. That included Democrats and Republicans that voted against the HEROES Act. And why, you ask? Because it was so hyper-partisan. There were so many things in that HEROES Act bill that would not have benefited the needs that we have right now. Now, I have personally talked to, I had the mayor of Dublin on the phone yesterday. I've reached out to all the mayors in this congressional district. Our office has talked to the mayor of Reynolds, Reynoldsburg. Uh, so, you know, we are doing that. That's how I get my information. That's how I, I talk to uh, Ohio Health ER director of emergency room services every week. I call my local hospital every week. I call Licking Memorial to get those updates of what actually is happening in this district. So I know what's going on in the district. I'm out there, I'm, I'm perfectly reachable and I'm available. We need to focus on the businesses. The hospitality industry is suffering greatly. Those are some of the biggest concerns that are out there with their, that industry. When I do go to businesses, as I've done throughout this whole district, and for the last four months have been going into businesses, you know, we talk about we need another round of PPP. That's what we need to focus on making sure. This economy is what's going to get us out of this pandemic. It is all about the economy. We have to work to make sure that we keep this economy open, opening and make, make sure people have available to get jobs. That's what we need to focus on. Well, I'll move on to our next topic, healthcare. Obviously, it's related to this, but a much broader issue. Ms. Shear, you support uh, a public option for health insurance. You support an income-based cap on healthcare expenses, and you support a rapid expansion of Medicare and Medicaid. How will private insurance companies be able to compete with that? And won't that lead to eventually, in the not too distant future, really a total government takeover of healthcare? And I'll give you two minutes here. My, my father was a family doctor in Delaware, and he raised me to believe and to understand and know that every single one of us deserves the basic dignity of being able to go in and see a doctor and not be um, bombarded with bills afterwards that we can't afford to pay. Right now, our health care system is the most expensive, yet the least effective in the world. It's not working. I support repairing the Affordable Care Act, which was not perfect, but it has given us things like coverage for pre-existing conditions, the ability to keep your children on your plan until they're 26. All of those things are at risk because my opponent and Donald Trump want to tear apart the Affordable Care Act, and their plan is there is no plan. Plan. There is no replacement plan. We need to make sure that every single American has health care they can afford. And the fact that health care has become political and that politicians are making decisions about our health care is astonishing. And it's brought us here today, and it has to change. And my opponent takes so much money from big pharma health insurance companies, and that's why he's always going to vote the way he votes. He's going to vote to benefit them and not the American people. And there is a way to make it competitive. The, the Lower Prescription Drugs Act would have done that, so it would have made it so that Medicare could compete, that the federal government could compete, uh, and lower. we could have seen lower prescription drug costs, and he voted against that. Congressman Balderson, what is your plan to cover folks with pre-existing conditions, cover folks on their parents' plans until they're 26, and keep lower, keep health uh, costs and health insurance rates lower? Mike, th this whole 
as it's become very political with health care, this pre-existing piece, the scare tactic that's out there. Absolutely will I not vote against, I've co-sponsored legisl legislation that will cover pre-existing conditions. Six million Ohioans in this state have pre-existing conditions. We all in this room have family members that are affected by pre-existing conditions. I will not take away coverage for pre-existing conditions. It just won't happen and that's not the thing I'm gonna do. As far as our healthcare piece, we are going to continue to work. The best thing for health care is let the individual and the, the relationship with the doctor cover our health care so we can lower that cost, get rid of the government. The government needs to step out of our way for health care coverage as far as I'm concerned. We have flexible spending accounts. We have associated state, we have health savings accounts. Uh, we have associated health plans. There are many things out there right now that we are doing to enact for more health care coverage and better way for employers and employees to get health care. And I think that that's what we need to focus on. As far as lowering our drug cost, there is a bipartisan bill, it's House Resolution 19, bipartisan support again, that limits the cap of seniors for $3,100 a year for the prescription drugs. Not only that, it also does not take away the innovation that's out there. We talk about science with the COVID, we talk about innovation and research, this allows it, and we need innovation now more than ever for what we're dealing with. Mr. Stewart, you come from a business background, trucking industry, I, I take it you probably have provided health insurance for your employees. Wouldn't it be better if you as a private company didn't have to take care of, have to worry about health insurance premiums anymore, and the government took a role on that, wouldn't, wouldn't that alleviate that burden from private companies? Well, I, I, I do want to point out uh, something, a contradiction that Elena just said that um, uh, I think it's astounding that politicians are making decisions over health care, but nationalizing, uh, uh, nationalizing health care is exactly politicians providing uh, answers on our health care. Uh, and so I, I definitely agree with you, uh, but I think the Affordable Care Act and many things we've done over the last decades have been in the wrong direction. Uh, what we had, precisely because of what you said, we had a third party payer problem, which we were trying to solve, uh, and we had a portability problem in, in, in insurance. We also had a, and that, that we had a cost problem, and that's what caused the increase in cost. A third party payer does not let the patient negotiate or discuss or take a, a charge of his own health care. Uh, and of course, portability is because it's all based on the company providing it. So I think there, uh, if we would take, uh, if we had done the things that are needed, and by the way, I'm running for office because somebody has to stand up for the free market, and health care has not been a free market. We have not had the Republican Democratic Party stand up for a free market. So, to your point, we should remove this. The, it, it started right after World War II, uh, when the Republicans let a law pass or, or encouraged the law that allowed the health insurance to be a, a benefit that is untaxed, pre-tax benefit. We can just simply remove that. Make it a, if the corporation decides to provide health insurance for their, for their employee, make it a, po, a, a taxable benefit. Uh, and then that shoves everything over to the, to the personal insurance side. And, and right now we can deduct health insurance from our personal income taxes, but we've got this ridiculous 7.5% uh, AGA, uh, adjusted gross income, AGI, uh, floor on what we can deduct, and we should just get rid of that. Let, let the American citizen deduct from their income taxes on the first dollar. Just like it, the problem started over time, it'll, it'll be straightened up over time. One of the, go, Congressman Baldwin, go ahead. I just wanted to add a couple of things to Mike, um, in, in, it, in its cases, and it's, it's something that has changed. Something that has happened with this COVID is telehealth and the changes that we have advanced in telehealth. Uh, speaking with Children's Hospital and working with them, they say in 2019, they've done more in the first six months of 2020, they have done more telehealth than they have in all 2019. The other piece I wanna put in there is I, I talked to a family, uh, a family that has two children with disabilities. 
the availability and, and for them to work from their home and speak with their daughter or, or son it, it, it is incredible for them. And I mean, it just, it, it puts such, it takes such a burden off of getting around. I do also want to add, you know, back to the pre-existing condition piece. Um, we had a father call in and, and I've worked with him and he had a one-year-old daughter that's been fighting, a, it's a life-threatening disease, worked for three months trying to get some sort of medication and work with that. And I just want to read real quick. Um, he reached out to us and I, he sent a thank you note to me and I have been in contact with him also. The very next day we received, desperate he reached out. The very next day we received a call because of the work you did, my daughter is receiving treatment on Tuesday. Over just a short couple of days, you changed our family forever and saved our daughter's life. She is doing well. They sent a picture of her on the playground recently. So I just want to add, those are that's that's how healthcare works, and that's what we're supposed to do. This year, people are some a lot of people are satisfied with their current health care. Yeah. They may not like the bill they get every month, but they're fairly satisfied with what they're getting. I, what do you say to them who are afraid that your plan or any plan that allows for more government involvement will limit their choice, limit their plans? The the government's already involved in our health care. And, and I support the Affordable Care Act, which allows you to keep your private plan if that's what you want. But there are so many people in the middle. So, so to qualify for Medicaid, you have to make, I think it's 22,000 a year for a family of two. That's 22,000 a year. What about everybody who, let's take a waitress who makes $30,000 a year. She doesn't work full time. She can't get benefits. What are her options? To go to the marketplace? When I shopped on the marketplace, the health care plan for my family of six, and this is the average cost I found out, it's about $2,000 a month, $1,700 to $2,000 a month. We cannot afford health care. My son broke his arm last summer in your district, Mr. Balderson, <laughs> and he broke his arm and the bill is $13,000, you know? And so we, one person can't fix that. We've got to work together. We have to work across the aisle. We have to make this not a political issue and we have to just figure out how to get through this as a country. It's a crisis right now. The healthcare system is falling apart and, you know, it's part of our infrastructure. So the government does have to be involved. That's why I love, you know, living here. I want my uh, federal government to at least make sure that we can afford uh, basic needs like health care. I want to move on to taxes and spending. Congressman Baldison, you support a balanced budget amendment. You say it's time for Congress to stop out of control spending. Now, before the pandemic hit, the federal deficit uh, doubled from $585 billion under President Obama in his last year to more than $1 trillion. Then the pandemic hit, and even and then the spending because of the stimulus and the and recovery, spending went up even higher. So let's put that aside for a moment. With Republicans in control of government, the deficit ballooned, largely because of the tax cuts favored by President Trump. Are you and your fellow Republicans really serious about balancing the federal budget? Mike, my experience, I am serious about it. I was in the state legislature. I had the opportunity to balance a budget that was out of budget, out of balance here in the state of Ohio. I sat on the finance committee to do that. Yes, I am very committed and serious about doing that. And we just try to go in so big and broad. And you know, going through the state legislature, and I know it's different than the federal legislature as, as far as balancing a budget, and it's much bigger. Uh, we're dealing with much more issues across the country, but it can be done. And you have to go through line by line item, and we do that as business people. I mean, we go down through our expenses and we see where we can we can cut. There's a lot of bureaucracy at the federal level. More, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how big it is. Uh, so I do think that we can take it very seriously. Under these conditions, I think now's not the time. Um, obviously, we have been spending trillions of dollars to do that. Uh, but, you know, once we get through this global pandemic, once we get everyone back to work that was working, I mean, our taxes are going to change. Let's not forget in 2019, December 31st, our unemployment was 3.5% in this country, the lowest in 50 years. Now we are where we are. We have to continue making sure there are more jobs than there were people to fill them. We have to get people back to work. The economy is what's going to drive down this budget deficit, and it's going to make the taxes a whole lot easier. Ms. Shearer, Joe Biden's tax plan would raise corporate the corporate tax rate. It would increase taxes on people, he claims, only people making $400,000 a year or more. Will you vote to raise taxes? Only on people making $400,000 a year or more. Um, and I support Joe Biden's tax plan. 
Right now, um, we're all sitting here facing this debt as a country, but also personally as Americans. The average American family making $98,000 a year has $92,000 in debt on top of their mortgage. So this isn't just a debt crisis for our country, it's a debt crisis for hardworking Ohio families. We have to solve this through innovation. And you know what just absolutely breaks my heart as a mom of four kids, and a business owner myself is seeing us fight like this and seeing us be so divided and, and seeing corporations run away with profits to other countries and paying zero in taxes, seeing our own president paying $750 in taxes a year. We have to increase our revenue as a country. We have to grow our economy, and that means we have to move forward into the future and not the past. And there's so much opportunity for our generation to do that. It's here, it's right in front of us, and we can create these jobs. We can create them in Ohio, and Ohio should be leading the nation in new industries. And when we increase jobs, and when we become a major exporter of whatever we are creating and leading um, in the future, we will decrease our debt. Mr. Stewart, what is the proper way for government to encourage business growth, but also gain the money from those businesses it needs to pay its bills? Well, it, um, I think my campaign has been uh, partially also to, uh, to speak to the American voter because uh, politicians in office or office holders are under a, a lot of pressure uh, for more spending and the American citizen has to understand that uh, all this all the this gets paid for eventually uh, and the cost of living is just way too high and it, it comes from a lot of government intervention a good example is housing we're getting ready for a, a we're already in a housing crisis uh, it, it, housing is too expensive for the average person, to, uh, for lower income people to afford. Um, there's a group here that uh, called uh, the uh, Affordable Housing Initiative. Uh, there's groups coming out now which are talking about this. This will turn into a homeless problem. But what we should have let happen in a housing crisis, we should have let the assets that are, the, the, the assets that are, in our economy fall to the proper level, for the proper worth. And so when we do these interventions in the economy, we have consequences that aren't seen. And uh, uh, a lot of it, it we, we worry a lot, uh, our politicians worry a lot about the income gap, but really um, that's, that's chasing your tail because uh, income increases always lag inflation. But if deflation occurs, we should encourage more deflation. If deflation occurs, you don't have to ask the boss for a raise. You're already better off. Congressman Balderson, let me, let me follow up on your, on your balancing the budget, cutting spending. As you know, you need to balance a budget, you need to cut your expenses, but also you need some revenue. We've seen how Amazon pays very little taxes in some years. We've seen the reporting that President Trump paid $750 in, in personal income tax or a couple of years ago when he was elected. Should there be something done to make sure that at least companies pay something or pay their fair share? And that would include, that would mean raising their taxes. Mike, I want to go back to the tax reform package. And I want to tell you what I, you know, when I'm speaking in the district or when I'm meeting with small business owners, that tax reform in 2017 that was passed, as you said, by President Trump, I was not in Congress at that time, but I fully supported that. And Every business that I go to benefited from that tax reform package, small, medium, large. Employers will say, I gave my employees health care that they were never able to have with that tax reform package. I was able to reinvest back in my business again. You know, when we allow these folks to do what they need to do, they're going to make it better for everybody. So, you know, it's, yes. Do we need to look at our expenses and, and how we balance? But that's the only way. You've got to cut expenses, uh, and, and we know that. But we have to address where we are, you know, where the heavy bureaucracy is in federal government. So you don't think Amazon should be paying more in taxes? You know, I mean, you're asking a question, Mike, that I, I think 
I've not looked at Amazon's books. Mm -hmm. um, I see the number of what's out there, but I'd like to verify some stuff. I mean, I'd like to see what they actually pay. I'd like to see what they do. I know that right now Amazon has employed over 3,500 people. Um, I, I know that I've had, had a couple small business owners lose employees to Amazon because they're paying their employees $20 an hour, $24 an hour, giving them health care, giving them benefits. So, you know, before we just start saying we're going to, you know, they have to pay taxes, let's verify some things. You know, we talk this stuff and the rhetoric that goes on. Let's look. Let's get inside and look at this. And that's how when we balanced the state budget under Kasich, um, we were $8 billion out of, out of deficit. And it doesn't matter the number. If you're a, if you're a dollar out, you're out of budget. So. This year, did your benefit, did, did you benefit personally, did your business benefit personally, individually, by the tax cut passed in 2017? No. And <laughs> what about the argument that if you lower taxes on businesses, they're able to invest in their employees, hire new employees, expand, offer health benefits they didn't offer before? I think, I think it's a pipe dream. I do, I, I do not trust uh, the corporations right now. I trust the American people, and the American people need a bailout, and we need not just jobs, but careers. And the thing is, Amazon's paying zero dollars in taxes and running small businesses out of business and competing for talent. So they'll take talent, a, a person, an employee, offer them full benefits, whereas small businesses, medium-sized, large-sized businesses in this district still have to offer that. So uh, they have to pay their share. And, and this isn't just Amazon. It's Google. It's Facebook. They're paying offshore taxes. We've got to wrangle them in. But when our politicians are bought and paid for by corporations like Congressman Balderson, it's not going to happen. My campaign is completely funded by individual donors, nearly 10,000 now. And that's why I will fight for the people, not corporations. I just want to say to one of the budget cutting items on Congressman Balderson's desk that he is co-sponsoring is the Senior Citizens Tax Elimination Act, which would deplete Social Security by 2023. Again, here, here Mike, the scare tactics that are out there. I mean, this, this is what's going on in Washington right now. We're pitting each other against each other. I am not going to take away Social Security or Medicare. My parents live on Social Security. My parents survive on Medicare. I am no way going to take away Social Security or cut their Medicare with their health care. So this whole thing with the pre-existing conditions, our health care issue that we talk about, and, and you know the rhetoric going back and forth of saying, we're going to take Social Security away from you, we're going to take Medicare from you, it's got to stop. I mean, that's why we're not getting anything done. One, one, just follow up. On the question is, did your business, did you personally benefit from the Trump tax cuts? No, Mr. I did not. And I, I don't believe so. I can go back and look. But I definitely didn't notice a big increase or benefit of any kind. Okay, we'll get to audience questions in a moment. But I want to get to this divisiveness, Congressman uh, Balderson. Now, this is unlikely. But we are living in the year of unlikely. <laughs> so let me run this scenario by you. If no candidate for president wins a majority of electoral votes, the House of Representatives would decide. Now, it's not a majority vote. Each state has one vote. And as we know, Ohio's congressional delegation is 12 Republicans and four Democrats. If this vote ever got to the House as a member of Ohio's delegation, would you support for president your party's candidate? the candidate who won Ohio's popular vote or the candidate who won the national popular so vote? You said popular vote. We go by electoral votes. So. I know, but if you would have decided in the House, you would have control. What would guide your vote? Would it be Ohio's vote, the national vote? No, it would be the national vote. It's our Constitution to have a peaceful transition, and I will abide by that. And I probably shouldn't sit here and say this, but I can tell you that most of the Republican members in Congress from the Ohio delegation would say transfer of power in a peaceful way, whatever the outcome is going to be. So, so, let me, so just to be clear, if, say, Joe Biden were to win the national popular vote, but not the Ohio popular vote, you would support Joe Biden for president if the vote came to the House? Mike, again, we go by electoral votes. We don't go by the popular know, but vote. The, so. the electoral college has been pushed out the side that's now in your hands as a member of the House. If Joe Biden... I don't, I don't, I'm confused by that answer a little bit because of that question because, I mean, that's, we don't decide. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. Yeah. So, but Donald Trump, President Trump, won the electoral votes, and that's how we judge our elections. This would be elections. if the electoral vote was tied or was not conclusive. If neither candidate got to 270, it could fall to the House. It would be in your hands I will, as a member I of Congress. I will vote for the winner of the election 
for president. That's National not. vote? Yes. Okay. Ms. Shear, same question for you. That's if Donald Trump were to win the popular vote in Ohio, as a member of the Ohio delegation, because it would fall to you in the next term, would you support Ohio's one vote in Congress going to Donald Trump? If Trump won the popular vote in Ohio? Yes. Yes, I would, I would go with the majority of Ohioans. I think, you know, this is, this is our democracy we're talking about, and it's, it's so precious, everyone. Please, let's preserve it. Mr. Stewart, I know you, you, uh, you probably don't support either of the candidates as a libertarian, but if you had a second choice. Well, we do have a presidential candidate. Yes, you do, Joe Jorgensen. If she was not, the, if she, you will vote for her, I'm no doubt. Right. But if we had ranked choice voting like they have in Maine, mm -hmm. who would be your second choice? Um, it, it, would, it, would be, uh, it would be Donald Trump would be my second choice. So as far as what your question would be, I would, go, I would go with the Electoral College vote. Whoever took the Electoral College vote. Um, had the most what was tied, the, though? The most National Electoral College vote. What if it was tied? Um, Which is how it gets to the House. That's how it gets to the House. Um, or if nobody gets to 270, that's ambiguous as well. I think I'd go with the Ohio popular vote in that okay. case. Okay. It is CMC's tradition to take questions from our audience, and of course, with no audience here, we have taken them virtually and ahead of time, and Jane Scott has our questions. I do, and we have quite a lot of questions, some of which you've already covered, so I'm going to skip those in um, courtesy to those people who have asked those questions who have already covered those things. Uh, Joe Borkman, I hope I said that name right, what will you, as our representative in Washington, D.C., do to make sure that our voices are heard and that all of your constituents' opinions influence your policy platform? There are several questions related to this that you have a very, very large, gerrymandered and very dis a very um, um, distinct and, and exactly, it's a very, very uh, diverse district. What would you do to serve those that have elected you? We'll start with you, Mr. Stewart. What was the question? I'm sorry. What would you do to serve this large district to make sure that all voices are heard? Well, I think that uh, I don't. I don't think there's as much diversity as people like to say uh, in this district. Um, I think the uh, uh, the Areas of uh, Zanesville or Mansfield or Newark, uh, Delaware County, uh, Columbus. Um, I think I think there's um, they're all Ohioans, and uh, and I think um, the same solutions for everybody. Were, I think that, that the solutions that work in Zanesville would work for uh, people in Columbus. So. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it'd be that difficult to serve this this region. I think he, hearing all the opinions throughout are, are very important. So just spending the time that you need to to make sure you've heard everybody's opinion is important. Uh, Joe, thank you for Joe camera. Thank you for your question. I appreciate it, and it's so important. So you know, this district has been we've been told that we're divided, and and we're not. You know, we have so much in common, and we need to focus on that first. I am a middle child, I'm one of six, and my art form was always to get everybody to get along. And I built a national women's network for women in digital and tech with women from both sides of the aisle, forced, and, and we were all behind a common cause, though. And, and that's what we need to do in this district, because no matter what, on January 4th, we need to heal, and we need to move forward. Some of the, the ways that we can do that, and I've promised to throughout my campaign, is to hold virtual town halls with you. Even when I'm in Washington, we live in a beautiful time where we can communicate instantly with you, and I'm not afraid of having those complicated conversations. It will be my job to represent every person in this district, and being someone who was born in Delaware, and I've lived just south of Worthington, my father and grandmother grew up in Clintonville. I, I also went to high school in Southeast Ohio. This is my home, and I cannot express to you how much, uh, how much I just am so excited to bring us together on, on January 1st, November 4th, once we finish this amazing race. <laughs> Congressman Baldison, you've lived with this wide-ranging district. How, what is your answer? I love it. I love it. I, 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 I'm out there every single day, and I, I love the people. I love the people that I communicate with. I love the people that I work with. Look, we've done over a 1,000 tours and meetings in the district since I've been in office for the last two years. We've done over 400,000 teletown halls since I've been in Congress. 
working with those people. We, my staff and I would sit down after each evening when we do a teletown hall, and for the people that did not have their questions answered, we called them back, including me, and asked those same questions. I love this district. I love the people I work with. It's, it is so much fun for me. I mean, it's in, it gives me the opportunity. I mean, I'm so blessed. To, to be able to have this job. And I thank God every morning and every night to be able to do this. And, you know, sometimes I joke around and say that, you know, I went and I helped one of the farmers pick beans two weeks ago. Um, you know, and I can come back and sit down with the corporate CEO or I can sit down with a small business owner and, and have that discussion too. So I, I think that, um, you know, my background allows me to do that. Follow up to this, census has been completed. We will have redistricting in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Would you support a map that makes this district much more competitive than it is now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Ms. Uh, I just wanted to say there is a teacher in Worthington who teaches political science who has offered her students extra credit for two years if they can reach you. So if you could, you could get back with her. But the one thing that is consistent about your record, Congressman, is that you do not show up for the people of this district. And, and while you're talking to thousands of people, I'm hearing from thousands who have tried to reach you, including a woman who lost her mother in a nursing home who could not go visit her because she was dying of COVID-19. And, and that's what we've heard. So, so if you do win this election, I implore you to please do a better job communicating with the people of this district. I'll let you respond, Congressman, if you'd like. Uh, my my facts, facts speak for themselves. Over a thousand visits and tours, I've worked relentlessly. I, I'm at home. My son and his wife live in Nashville, Tennessee. This is my life. I give every absolute thing to the congressional district, and I always will. What, uh, this is a question from Kara Morgan. What will be your legislative priority? Perhaps one, two, three, top on your list. Ms. Shearer, will start with you. The first thing we need to do is contain COVID-19. We have got to contain it because right now it is, it is running rampant. We have passed the point of no return as far as any kind of viable tracing. Um, we're seeing, uh, we've got a record number of cases today. It's going up and up and up. So before we can recover economically, we need to contain COVID-19. And, and then we need to move through the recovery process and we will bounce back. We can bounce back. If we have true innovative leaders in Washington who aren't bought and paid for by corporations, but working for the American people. And, and nestled in within that is healthcare. In this healthcare crisis, we've spent a a lot of time talking about today and then we also we also have to create careers for Americans not just jobs but careers and we have to look forward to the future uh, there's there's so many crises upon crises and and things that American families are facing from college education uh, to health care and jobs of the future and we've got to get to work in a bipartisan way immediately Congressman Baldwin obviously the COVID piece right now is, is the top of everybody's uh, agenda, uh, and it will continue to be uh, as we work through this and, and deal with it. Um, but for everything else, I, I mean, I prioritize what the district wants. So I'm going to follow the guidelines of my congressional district. The folks that are out there, those are the people that want to see things done. Uh, and, and that's how I prioritize, prioritize my legislation as I move forward. So aside from COVID, what are they telling you is the bigger priority? Bigger. Jobs. Jobs. Everyone wants to jobs. Mr. Stewart. I think uh, the free market it will be able to deliver goods and services much cheaper and of higher quality than anything the government can do. So that would be a priority of mine to free up the free market to address the co uh, cost of goods and services and lower the cost of living for uh, our citizens. And um, in addition to that, I think the ideas I presented with uh, healthcare, I, want to work on those very, uh, that'd be a very high priority. And also something we haven't talked about much today is uh, redefining the, the mission of law enforcement and border patrol and the military. Uh, all those, the missions of those entities need to be narrowed and redefined. Um, and uh, so that's another, that would be the third priority. 
Last question, apparently. Oh, there are so many. Um, I'm gonna collect a couple. Brittany Hubert asks a general question. What is your stance on climate change? Strategy, importance in the agenda? Congressman? Uh, hey, Mike, you and I go back on this when all the energy talk was going on. Um, yeah, it's important. Uh, what are we doing to change it? We're doing a lot. And here in, in this country, it's working. Our carbon is 30% down from where it was. We have cut carbon emissions 30%. That's more than anybody else in the world combined. So we are addressing it. We need the whole energy portfolio. We need it all because we know it works. Natural gas is abundant. For the first time in this country's history, we are the number one exporter of natural gas, the cleanest form of fuel that we have. Yes, solar panels work, absolutely. I, I support that always. But we need that baseline energy piece to make sure that we can keep our electricity going. And more importantly is we want the cheapest form of energy that we can provide our constituents. What level of government subsidies should the government award for the various uh, energy modes of solar, natural gas, oil, coal, wind? Should they be putting more subsidies towards wind and solar than they are now, say, towards coal, which increase emissions? No, I, I don't think they should be putting more to one or the other. That's kind of what we were dealing with uh, several years ago, um, is, is the mandates. The market will work itself out, and, and current utility companies here in the state of Ohio are going renewable energy, but they're also doing natural gas. There are eight new plants here in the state of Ohio that are natural gas plants. We need to continue doing that. Um, and, and, you know, the subsidies have gone down for each each one. So I want to see that. I mean, in 2010, 2011, a kilowatt hour for wind was almost 32 cents. Coal was three to six cents. That has gone down tremendously now. I mean, solar energy has become very affordable. Uh, Ms. Shear, climate change. So I am a mom of four, as I mentioned, three teenagers in the house, and climate change is top on their list every single day as it should be for each and every single one of us because it is such a very real threat. And Congressman Balderson is one of the um, most offending um, uh, he, he is against any kind of climate change reform. So he's a great offender in everything that he's voted against, from the Climate Change Act now to um, and most recently expanding access to sustainability, a Sustainable Energy Act, which would have granted money from the Department of Energy to rural electric co-ops. Um, there's so much that we have to work on, and another huge piece of it is corporations and regulating corporations that are just really the, the culprits when it comes to, um, you know, emitting so much. And what we can do is offer things like uh, solar panels to dairy and hog farmers. We can, we can work with corporations and figure out how to lower emissions even further, because what we're doing right now, it's not enough. And if we think COVID is bad, just wait. And, and right now, California, Colorado, uh, I know my first climate refugee, one of my friends I went to high school with, moved back from California to Ohio. So this is very real threat. It's right on our doorstep. It's here. Every, everyone knows it, and we've got to address it. But if we don't follow physicians, scientists with COVID, how are we going to do that with climate change? Mr. Stewart, what's the government role in, in limiting climate change? It's, it's important for people to understand that uh, prosperity is a very important factor in the environment because prosperous countries are the only ones that can afford to, to care about the environment, which is why we see problems, uh, why China and India are doing uh, uh, more to pollute our environment than the United States is, and uh, as far as the uh, carbon emissions. And there's a lot of other issues that we need to deal with. Um, uh, the plastics in our oceans and our, in our Great Lakes so we need to have a balanced approach to our environmental problems. And also I'd like to have the individual freedom. Um, anything I can do to help the individual get energy freedom uh, w would be something I would do. And I, I think it's fantastic if, you know, if we could have houses with solar on them, that would be great. I think Elena's idea about farming was a great idea as well. I want to thank the candidates for directly answering all of my questions and taking part in the civil discussion. We'll turn it back over to Steve. 
Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> I have a lot of hopes today. I hope you found this forum to be informational. I hope if you voted that you found your vote to be validated. I hope if you haven't voted that you've gotten some information that will help you make a good vote, and I hope you vote. Um, I want to uh, also offer an invite to join us next Wednesday, November 4th, the day after the election, for a post-election wrap-up. Um, should be interesting. Hopefully we will have good, solid news and final news. Um, I also want to thank our political series sponsors, Hannah News Service and the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. And of course, let's thank our speakers, Troy Balderson, Elena Shear. John Stewart, and of course, Mike Thompson. And special thanks to all of you in live stream land. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you.